Today is episode 15 of the Telecaster Student Build. If you haven't been following this series, you might want to go back and take a look at some of the previous episodes within it. Uh, we are talking about finish sanding and finishing of necks in this episode. The last episode, we basically took the, uh, the Telecaster body and another Strat body that I was working on uh, for the in-class project, and I took this and dyed the back and then sprayed tint to make it even darker, and it's a really deep kind of emerald green. Uh, you can see the grain, but it from the camera view, you probably won't be able to see it, but it's pretty cool looking. Anyway, we got that done. We showed the other Telecaster that I've been working on, and we're basically all the way up to the point where we've got the final coats of finish on it, and it's just got to be uh, final sanding and buffing, and these guys are ready. So the next is the next thing that we're gonna work on here. And I've got the two Telecaster necks. I've got this one that has a uh, bronze fret wire in it, uh, which will go pretty well with the gold hardware on the, uh, the guitar there. And this one has stainless steel fret wire and the blue slash purple uh, synthetic stones that I installed will go really, really nicely with this uh, bluish purple body for sure. So looking good. Now, I've, I went ahead and, uh, and finished sanding all but one of these necks. In fact, I've got the two Stratocaster necks that, uh, that I've built for the school uh, projects. This one is a flamed maple. Uh, curly maple neck, which is uh, very pretty. I'm looking forward to that, getting finished on that one. And this is a one-piece solid maple neck with a uh, embedded truss, uh, spoke wheel truss rod, which was uh, plugged up in the back um, with a little skunk stripe. All of these necks are finished sanded, and they're ready for the tinting, dyeing process, and, uh, and the finishing. Uh, except for this one. This one I took up to approximately 120 grit. I got most of the previous rasp uh, marks out of there, but not quite all of them. And it's not to final specs yet. It's still a little bit square on the edges. And this is where we end up after we shape the necks and do a little bit of preliminary sanding on them. So we're gonna take that the next step and that's what I wanna show you in this video. In the first part of this video, I wanna show you how we can sand that to be finish ready. And then we're gonna talk about dyes and we're actually gonna dye one of these necks and then we're gonna tint the other three necks. Again, I'm not really here to show you the finishing process, but we'll talk about it a little bit and I'll, I'll show you the end results. So let's get busy on this neck. Let's talk about some of the tools we're gonna to be using. I recommend, and I'm having my class finish this using hand sanding techniques. And the reason why is because it's the safest way to finish a neck. You get to the point, you've done so much hard work on these guys, getting it up to the point where you're ready for the finish and you just don't wanna mess anything up. So some of the tools like I showed before are little tiny uh, homemade, this is from a one inch piece of MDF with sandpaper stuck to it and you can work up to 120, 220, 320 and you can work back and forth all the way along and around and get that neck where you need it to be. And it's got a nice long reference, about 10 inches, nine inches of reference right there. Uh, the other type of blocks that you could use are homemade, again, MDF. I've got uh, one grit on one side, another grit on the other side. And that gives me maybe about a, whatever, four inch reference to keep things nice and flat as I work and as I sand. So that, those are good tools. You can also buy blocks. This is uh, one that Stu Max sells. It's a very rigid foam that you stick then sandpaper to it. Um, and that's a pretty good source. You just don't want to start hand sanding with, with no 
straight reference. Uh, you'll end up putting dips and grooves and things like that. So you have to work with something that's got at least some straight edge. This would be probably be the minimum length that I would want. Um, other things that you could use, this is a, uh, a black hard foam that comes in longer lengths and you can kind of cut it to whatever you want. It's I think called door last uh, on Amazon. Um, it, it's normally black when it's not covered with dust, uh, but uh, that's a pretty good rigid foam block to be using uh, to sand your, your neck or any other thing. Uh, and then the other, the other idea that we could do here is we could work with a block like this. This is kind of one of my favorites. It's got spring-loaded um, hold downs on either side, and we can begin taking this, and it's about, uh, I don't know, what, eight inches, uh, something like that, and we can start working those edges. Again, nice long reference, and we'll work until we get the edges nice and smooth. Okay, that's the whole idea there, is to get the transition from the fretboard to the neck wood so that you don't feel a lump or a ridge right there. And that's gonna take some effort to get that down. So you can work on one side, work on the other side, you can pull it out of the vise, and you can work on blending it together by working a continuous rotation from one side all the way around to the other side. All right, something like that. And it's still there, it's gonna take a while to get this done. So those are the basic hand sanding tools that I use. And I keep swapping out the paper on, uh, on like that yellow block and I'll go from 120 to 220 to 320. Then I'll actually wet the wood to kind of raise the grain a little bit and I'll come back with the maroon colored Scotch-Brite pads, which are equivalent to approximately 400 grit. And so after I raise the grain, I will just use this to take it back down and that will leave a really great, great finish. Now you don't have to take it this high, uh, but this is, this is the way that I learned to do it um, from a mentor of mine, and I can't argue with his results, so therefore I adopted it. And in fact, I wanna show you some advanced techniques of sanding the next two, but I want to give you a disclaimer first. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm about to use a, uh, a power sander, okay? In this case, it's air-powered sander, a DA sander, five inch rigid back DA sander. I'm gonna use that to sand the rest of the processes of my neck. The disclaimer is don't do your first neck that way if you can't afford to ruin it because any using any power tools with a neck at this stage will more than likely ruin that neck unless you've done it a few times and ruined a couple necks in order to develop the finesse and the techniques of using power tools. That's my recommendation. Do whatever you want, but I would suggest that you can work towards the power tools but have some practice necks. All right, here's the tools of the trade for doing it this way. And I know there's gonna be a lot of discussion of, of whether this is a good way to do it or not, but I will tell you straight up that I learned it from uh, this exact technique um, and tools from Don Grosh of uh, Grosh Guitars. If you're not familiar, he's been doing it 25 years. I think he knows what he's doing and uh, his guitars are pretty amazing. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna use um, a five inch DA sander. This just happens to be a Dynabraid uh, brand. We are going to use paper for that ranging from 120 grit all the way up to 320. We're also gonna start with the rigid pad that comes stock with this sander, and then we're gonna step up to a half inch soft uh, foam pad interface. All right, we're gonna do that only in certain areas. And then other areas, we're gonna tackle 
by hand along the same process as we're doing the grits, we'll do some hand sanding within that. When I'm hand sanding, I like to just to take the, the paper off of the sander and wrap it around some type of contour device. In this case, some of my, uh, some of my spindles from the oscillating spindle sander. I'll just wrap it right around there and I'll work some of the areas. Now, I'm doing this on top of a downdraft table, so I won't be wearing a mask in this particular case. It will be hard to talk, so most of the sanding processes I will speed through and I'll try to explain to you what I'm doing before I start. The key thing when you're using a power tool to do this is to work in key segments. Um, I will take this and I will take it on the heel, but very, you know, very flat and I will, will not spend a lot of time there. I will work on the back of the headstock, again flat, but won't spend a lot of time there. I'll work on the front of the headstock and I'll go flat, but I'll stop short of this curve and save that for when I'm using the soft interface pad. Um, I'll do the edges of the headstock all by hand and the edges of the heel all by hand. All right, and the biggest part is the neck itself. Now, if I just work back and forth like this, I'm gonna end up spending twice as much time in the center as I am on the edges because I'm passing it twice for every once here. So occasionally you'll see me just work just the edge area back and forth to kind of get that nice and round and get all the little kind of um, transition areas perfectly smooth and you'll see me doing that on both sides but I will with the rigid pad stay clear of tr of ramping up any of those transitions um, either the heel or the headstock transition because that will just groove it so I'll stay short of that and I'll catch that either by hand and or with the soft foam interface pad so that's the basic concept of what we're going to do I'm also going to stage my calipers close by because I know what dimensions I want on this neck and I will stop uh, sanding when I get there. If I'm short of there, I'll spend a little bit more time sanding. All right, currently we're measuring 21.75 and 24.3. And I'm looking to be 21 and a quarter to 21 and a half millimeters, somewhere in there and about 24 millimeters down at the 12th fret, plus or minus a little bit. So I basically have about 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters that I can take off of the back of the neck in the sanding process. I know because I've got a little bit more of a D shape than I want in there, and I want that transition to be a lot more smooth and, you know, kind of almost where you can't even feel it transition so smooth. I've got a little bit more I'm going to be working on the side, so I'll probably spend more time sanding on the sides. The other key thing I want to point out is don't go so far over that you wrap around that fingerboard. All right, you want to go just up where it trans and feathers in to the bottom portion of that fingerboard, but you don't want to wrap around at all. So be very careful about that. Again, last time I'm going to warn you, do not do this on the first neck or the primary neck for a project. Have practice necks. Uh, that you build and you can use techniques like this to speed up the process and get way better results But you gotta practice on a couple necks. I know I said that before I'm repeating myself, but Trust me on that one <laughs>
The other tool you want to have is some sort of straight edge. I don't need the square, but I can use this, this rule as a straight edge just to make sure that I'm not creating any dips. Slightly high in here is what I talked about. Spending more time in this part of the neck than there. So I'm gonna work that just a little bit more, but I mean, it's ever so slight. And it's looking great up on the first fret side. Perfectly straight. check the neck is with your hand. If you run your hand, if you run your hand along the neck like you're playing, you will feel any deviations. And I really like the sides. It's really blending blending in very nicely. I have a tiny bit more. I feel like I could take off from the from the transition to the fretboard. Just a little tiny bit. So I'm just going to continue to work up the grit. I'm up to 150 and I'm gonna focus on those areas a little extra as I continue to go up in grits. And I think by the time I get where I'm going, it's gonna be nice. I feel like I'm almost there. It's really, really close to being such a smooth transition that I can't even feel it. I'm gonna keep working it on the 150 a little bit, but this is a good chance to also stop and just double check your measurements. I know we're working it down a little bit. 21.64, 24.2. So I've, I've worked it down about half of what I ultimately want it to be. So I'm in good shape. I'm, I'm gonna just keep working the 150 uh, with the rigid pad and then uh, We'll check it out again. I, I think I wanna be, I wanna be in the shape to the final shape that I'm comfortable with at 150. Once I step up to 180 and 220, I'm not removing a whole lot of material. So let's keep working it. At about 150 grit, I'm gonna start feathering all the edges ever so slightly. That will help the adhesion in the finishing process. Sharp edges, sharp corners don't do as well with the finish as ones that have a itsy bitsy little radius to them.
one last step here. We've gone all the way up to 320 grit using the same process all for every single step that I've outlined. And the neck is feeling awesome shape, texture. One last step for me, you don't have to do this. I'm going to wet the whole thing down. What? Water on wood? You can't do that. It's called de-whisking, de-whisking, okay? And basically, you're raising the grain. I'm gonna let this dry for a few minutes, and then I'm gonna come back. And one last step is to take my approximately 400 grit Scotch-Brite pad. Scotch -Brite pad. Um, this is the uh, burgundy color and I'm gonna wipe it down by hand. And that is gonna de-whisk um, all of the, the fibers and make it just dead smooth. Not as important when you're using a solvent-based finish, but if you're using a water-based finish, it's very important to do this step. Uh, but I do it anyway. I think it's just a good habit transfer, and I'll be using a solvent-based finish. So give this a few minutes, and I'll come back, and we'll wipe her down and be ready. All right, I actually leave the downdraft table on and let the air just kind of pull and circulate around. It dries a lot quicker that way, but it's totally dry. Uh, we'll take the burgundy Scotch-Brite pad and we'll just wipe down all of the surfaces that got wet. Doesn't take much. And actually each one of the grits from 120 up to 320, each one progressively gets faster and faster because you're, you're removing a lot less material. All you're really needing to do is remove the scratches from the previous layer at that point in time. I wish you guys, I wish you guys could feel this. I mean, this is such a beautiful uh, feeling neck. It's almost one that you'd wish you kind of wouldn't even put finish on and just play like that. Uh, but to protect the wood, I am gonna put some finish on it. Well, here's the neck that we just finished. Just wiping it off with a little naphtha. Good cleaner. It's looking beautiful. All right, the next step, let's talk about dyes, finishes, tints. We could take and actually rub on dye onto these necks and get it colored for that vintage amber color or whatever other color that you want, but vintage amber is typically, you know, what, uh, what I'm shooting for on these type of necks. And that's certainly one way to do it. Now, the problems that you may incur with doing dye directly to the wood is it could have some blotchiness. Maple's not really known for blotchiness, but you could have some blotchiness that occurs. So you can try to minimize that by putting on a little alcohol first and then going with the dye on top of that, and that sometimes helps. Um, or you could just take the uh, aniline dyes. In this case, I've got two Stumac ones. I've got vintage amber, and I've got medium brown. Okay, you could use vintage amber directly, but that's a little bit too much yellow for my taste. Uh, so what I've done is I've mixed up a concoction here that has 100 milliliters of alcohol, and it's got 30 drops of the vintage amber and then 10 drops of the uh, medium brown. So it's a three to one ratio. Sometimes I'll do a four to one if I want it just a little bit more uh, amber but three to one is what I like. So instead of rubbing that on the neck, I can take my finish, my seal coat that I'm gonna spray onto here, and I can put 
in approximately the same amount. In fact, 30 drops and 10 drops, uh, probably in enough liquid to spray on uh, the first a coat or two of sealer will be perfect. And the idea with tinting is when you spray that on, you can look to see if it's amber enough or if it's dark enough of an amber, and then you can spray a little bit more. And after you get it all set, then you can go your clear coats on top of that. So you have a lot of control over the intensity. Uh, I've basically tested this and I could rub it directly on and it's gonna be right where I want it to be and that's fine but there's definitely less control when you're doing it that way. Now the advantage of dyeing the neck directly, which I will do on this neck, and that is because this is curly maple. A beautiful piece of curly maple uh, for the strat that I am building in the, uh, in the school for the demonstration guitar. It's that kind of green apple uh, color strat that I uh, showed or I showed dyeing in the last episode. But anyway, if I rub the dye onto this neck, then I will, I will basically have the opportunity to either scotch bright or sand it back a little bit and put a little bit more on and that will intensify the curl in the neck which will look really nice. So we are gonna dye this one and then we are gonna spray tint on this one and the other two necks that I'm, that I'm building right now. All right, so again, what we talked about was one option to minimize blotchiness is I can take a little bit of just alcohol and pre-wet it and that won't allow as much to soak in initially. And then you can kind of take your time, see how it goes and adjust fire from there. So that's gonna evaporate pretty quickly. So let's, so let's move on to the dye, the dye concoction, I suppose I should say. It's a beautiful shade of amber with just that little tiny bit of brown. I don't really want to get it on the fretboard. I don't mind if it gets on the sides of the fretboard, uh, but I don't want it to get on the top. So I'll be careful and not be loose with the dye and let it kind of slosh all over the place. Since this is diluted with alcohol, it will evaporate and it will dry per pretty quickly. I really like the shade. But I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna come back and scotch bright it again with that burgundy uh, scotch bright, and um, then I'm gonna reapply the dye and try to get more to take um, into the curl.